I'd like to talk to you today about an experiment in teaching and learning called Breaker. Breaker is a design-led social entrepreneurship program. What that means is we introduce young people to a creative problem-solving process that they use to identify the needs of a community and then translate those needs into business opportunities. In the last year, we've created three products and seeded the businesses behind them. They are Mobo, a service for sharing, receiving, and engaging with stories via text message, Unbound, a video reference tool, and FarmBlocks, a portable, modular, raised bed growing system. It might surprise you to know that few among the Breaker team would call themselves product designers or entrepreneurs, initially anyway. So what we do is issue a challenge to an interdisciplinary team of young people, introduce them to the design process, build a network of people, places, and things, and expect a business to result. Let me tell you about the project we completed just one week ago today, the Urban Agribusiness Challenge that resulted in farm blocks. The mission of this company is to transform a million acres of underutilized urban space into farm, one block at a time. It's a solution meant to answer this challenge that we posed to our team of 18 to 24 year olds who came from across the US to convene in New York City for the last three months. The challenge came from what we call our project visionaries. These are experts in the field who provide inspiration and context in TED style talks that kick off this three month journey. So in this case, Major Carter, founder of Sustainable South Bronx, and Danielle Gould of Food and Tech Connect. They also provide ongoing feedback and guidance as the project develops. So let me introduce you to the Breaker Urban Ag team. This is Ben, he's an economist. And Tyler, a writer and an artist. This is Barb, she's a blogger and all around social media maven. You may be wondering what folks like this are doing on an urb urban agribusiness team. You see, we don't require any content area expertise in order to participate in a project because we believe that designing solutions to big global challenges like feeding cities requires diverse perspectives and inputs. That said, we always make sure there are a few ringers on the team, people who bring the deep tacit understandings that others can build on. So this is Seth, he's an urban farmer from LA, and Sarah, who's majoring in environmental studies, and this is Shelley, who's studying architecture. So they complement one another, and they bring their respective networks with them. What we look for in a breaker is a love for creative collaboration, a desire to share your unique skills and talents with our team and to put them toward our challenges, and also tenacity. This is Kenyatta. He embodies all of these traits and more. He's a community organizer from Philadelphia. He's led numerous greening initiatives there. He's also a high school dropout. He found Breaker's Urban Ag Challenge posted on the UnCollege group on Facebook, and he applied. So we assemble these diverse teams. They come to us by way of our partner organizations and social media channels. They apply through our site, finalists are interviewed, and then we choose 15 for each unique project organized around a different challenge. So our previous challenge was the future of the book. Our upcoming challenge is technology for civic engagement. They will tell you they were attracted to Breaker for the opportunity to participate in a project with social impact and to connect with some of our industry partners. They represent a growing desire to learn by doing. So what we do is throw them out into the field, literally. But first we introduce them to something called human-centered design, an approach popularized by the design firm IDEO. And this requires um, an initial stage of intensive research and also that the needs of the end user, the people you're designing with or for, maintain a central focus in the design process. So we learn about research methods using the IDEO toolkit and also in a workshop with Frog Design before they head out to investigate the needs and realities of more than 20 different sites across the spectrum of urban agriculture in New York City, from growers to shippers, sellers to consumers. Sites like Gotham Greens, Brooklyn Grange, Bright Farms. They read studies and articles. They meet with industry experts like vertical farming pioneer Dixon de Pommier and Britta Riley of Window Farms before we circle back at IDEO's New York City studio to share the stories we've gathered and uh, to begin looking for themes and patterns. So as an aside, it may sound like this is a pretty straightforward linear process. It's not. Keep in mind that it is recursive, it is messy, it's often rife with tensions. But that's when some of our best work happens. So here are some of the stories we heard. This is River Park Restaurant, 
located next to a stalled construction site on East 29th Street, one of 668 stalled sites across the city, by the way. Uh, so in their desire to be a farm-to-table restaurant, they worked out a deal with the developer of the adjoining lot to use the space for growing, the stipulation being that it had to be a temporary setup. So they experimented with different growing systems and settled on this lightweight, low-cost crate that meant the whole farm could be transported in a matter of hours. This is Lori Showman of New York Sunworks. She's led numerous capital campaigns that have put greenhouses on the rooftops of city schools. The problem she pointed to was a lack of stewardship. She told us stories about greenhouses um, needing specific staffing allocations to be maintained over time. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. And there are instances where greenhouses end up being used as storage sheds. This is Kim, a mom raising a family in New York City. She herself was raised on a farm in Ohio. She wishes her family was more connected to the food they eat. So these are just a small sampling of some of the stories that we heard that lent us insight. We came to the idea that there was an opportunity to improve and expand on container farming for restaurants, for schools, for farms, and for the backyard enthusiast. So we started to brainstorm around this and a whole bunch of other ideas in workshops facilitated by MTV Scratch and with interaction and industrial designers who helped us through this divergent thinking phase. So that by the midterm, we had seven emerging business concepts, from a mobile app to a CSA restaurant. Farm Blocks was not the favorite going in. We presented these to some additional partners, folks from Google and Q Labs and Slow Money, and they provided us with some critical feedback. Based on that feedback and another round of research, we voted and Farm Blocks went into development. A farm in a box delivered to your door. It's the 21st century Victory Garden. More than a product, it's also a service designed to support the novice to the expert grower. They're launching with a business to business strategy with plans to expand into the retail market. But still, at this particular point in time, it's still an idea. Ideas are easy, it's execution that's hard. So how do you transform ideas into businesses? Our partners at QLabs have been instrumental in this regard. In addition to inviting us into their co-working space of half a dozen startup companies, they've closely mentored the Breaker team. And we learned from the Holsti founders about building a business with a conscience. And we're introduced to the sandbox network of young social entrepreneurs. This is Charlie O'Donnell of uh, Brooklyn Bridge Ventures dropping in to talk to us about financial models and about pitching product to investors. All the while, we're testing, evaluating, reflecting, and tweaking that product. Until one week ago, today, we presented Farm Blocks to an audience of investors and sustainable business leaders at Green Spaces, thus marking the end of Breaker's Urban Ag Challenge, but just the beginning for Farm Blocks. People often ask if Breaker is about process or product, and it's really about both. The mandate to design a commercially viable product with social impact is a huge driver, but launching it is not a necessary condition for success. At the end of the three months, some of the breakers will say, I'm done, I'm moving on to something else now, but others will decide to push forward with that product. And they step into unfamiliar roles that unveil unseen potential, both for them and for the world. Either way, they all leave Breaker with an entrepreneurial mindset and a, a toolkit for designing solutions to the problems they'll face, large and small, for the rest of their lives. We see ourselves in a space between youth empowerment organizations dedicated to developing young leaders and business incubators, which are programs that support startup companies as they're developing new products. Obviously, the two are not mutually exclusive, but Breaker proposes a space between. We say, you want to change the world, but you're not sure where to start. You know you have something to contribute, and you're looking for a place to apply it. Breaker says, come, have we got a challenge for you. You may be wondering where this model comes from. Well, when I started teaching in the New York City public schools, I quickly learned that the work that best engaged my students was project work, project-based learning, that addressed authentic, real-world problems, relied on collaborations both inside and outside of the classroom, and provided a sense of audience for students' work, be it performance, publication, exhibition. I've always been most interested in the spaces that live in the margins of traditional schooling, after-school programming, 
service learning, library 2.0, because it's there that you see kids' intrinsic motivation to learn. And the question for me was always how to create the conditions that would capitalize on that motivation. In 2009, I became a TED Fellow, and it was my exposure to that community that got me rethinking project-based learning in terms of design thinking. I saw that the creative problem-solving design process meshed with project work in many ways, but offered something more. Human-centered design requires the same rigorous research, interviewing, and empathy work that was always central to the classroom projects I taught. And I appreciated the permission to fail inherent in that iterative methodology, because failures are some of our richest learning opportunities. But unlike solutions that might come out of project work, design solutions are constrained by commercial viability. So I saw the design process as a way to link learning with entrepreneurship, so that problem solving became more than an academic exercise. I started tuning in to the larger conversation about design's applications to education, being led by the K-12 Lab, Project H, Prototype Camp, and various other organizations and initiatives. At the same time, in my role as an ed tech consultant, I was often asked to review new dig digital products. What I noticed is that many of these products failed to understand their users, the very teachers, administrators, and students they were intended for. And I thought this pointed to the need for entrepreneurs, particularly in the ed tech space, to better understand user-centered design. But these interactions with entrepreneurs proved valuable for another reason. They were my introduction to the startup scene in New York City. Over the last several years, increasingly niche startup incubators have opened up shop along with numerous co-working spaces for entrepreneurs and freelancers. These are nodes in New York City's innovation ecosystem. They've built a culture of creative collaboration. They are hubs for learning, mentoring, peer feedback, a whole social support system. And then I learned about an incubator, not in New York, but in Boulder, Colorado, called the Unreasonable Institute, where they were dedicated to nurturing businesses and entrepreneurs who were working to address some of the same global challenges we were looking at in our school curriculum, like clean water, for example. And I thought to myself, why weren't we asking students to do more than learn about the problem? They need to be part of designing the solutions, in part because it makes their learning more relevant, but also because we need their fresh insight on some of these entrenched problems. So I decided to build a context that would allow them to do just that, to learn about a global challenge while contributing to its solution and at the same time, engineering career opportunities for themselves. And this is how Breaker took shape. I share the story with you today, not with the idea that you will try to replicate the model, but in the hope that I can encourage you to take inspiration from diverse inputs, to look beyond the school community and tap networks across real and virtual worlds in an effort to design more innovative education models. Models, plural. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. We've tried that, it's failed us. I suggest we learn from this failure and design multiplicity out of it. Breaker is one alternative learning pathway in what I hope will be many, many more. Thank you.